I have not asked for a single program which did not cause one or all Americans some inconvenience or some hardship or some sacrifice. But they have responded, and you and the Congress have responded to your duty. And I feel confident in asking today for a similar response to these new and larger demands. It is heartening to know, as I journey abroad, that our country is united in its commitment to freedom and is ready to do its duty. Kennedy, too busy with other crises at the peak of the Cold War, had assigned a task force regarding Iran's affairs. This task force contained mostly young idealist hotheads, such as Robert Comer and Kenneth Hansen, well known for their excessive anti-Shah position. What they had in mind was to micromanage Iranian politics, administration, and military affairs. Meaning, running the country from Washington in an American fashion, which the Shah did not accept. Julius Holmes, the U.S. ambassador to Tehran, also supported the Shah strongly on this. Nevertheless, during those years of guessing games with Washington, the Shah introduced his bloodless white revolution, which to this date still looks advanced, progressive, and ahead of its time and principles, especially when compared to other backwards movements called a revolution. With the implementation of the vast program of social and economic reform to which we have set our hands, and with the self-reliance which springs from a strong and ancient nationalism, and faith in the rightness and integrity of our cause, Iran will advance in the right direction. With the support of our friends, the great country of America foremost among them, who take their stand on the same front with us and share in the defense of the same ideals and a similar way of thinking and living, we shall pursue our course. The Shah had to wait eight years for Nixon so they could together work on plans that they had envisioned years before. These were the years that the White House realistically listened to the Shah, and the benefit was mutual for both nations. The landslide victory of Richard Nixon in 1972 for his second term presidency was nothing but good news for Mohammad Reza Shah. After all, he had another four years in hand to take his nation to the next level of progress. He could start the next move in the international stage, bringing awareness to the industrial world about their addiction to the cheap energy source of developing nations. We have got to really friendly warn the world that you will better find other sources of energy because uh, not only it is... Uh, going to run dry in another 30 years but uh, it's almost a pity uh, almost a crime to burn this precious oil to heat uh, houses or to light electrical bulbs or even run trains when uh, you have at what we know actually 10,000 derivatives of the in the petrochemical field Nixon understood that the price of oil, set in 1958 at $2.50 per barrel, was not reasonable, considering it had not increased again until 1973, even though the price of all imported commodities of the oil exporting countries had gone up every year since then. Nixon also knew that to prevent communism from spreading into that region, you needed a strong Iran with the strong leadership of the Shah to defend against it. The Shah was feeling lucky that with Nixon in the White House, progress in Iran could be expedited. Then, the unthinkable happened. The prelude to the Iranian Revolution. The easiest course would be for 
me to blame those to whom I delegated the responsibility to run the campaign. But that would be a cowardly thing to do. I will not place the blame on subordinates, on people whose zeal exceeded their judgment, and who may have done wrong in a cause they deeply believe to be right. In any organization, the man at the top must bear the responsibility. The Watergate scandal, the end of Nixon's presidency, and led to the arrival of two other inexperienced novices into the White House. First, Gerald Ford, perhaps an accidental president who replaced the resigned President Nixon. Gerald Ford started a mixture of hidden and open war with the Shah, apparently under the assumption that a victory over the Shah on the oil price hike, regardless of its dire consequence for the Shah, for Iran, for the stability of the region, and for world peace, would improve his chances of being elected in the 1976 presidential elections. Then Jimmy Carter arrived with his unseasoned team, unaware of the realities of the world. With his own dream of going into history books as the one who defeated communism by creating an Islamic green belt, and with his selective human rights advocacy that nurtured the seeds of the Islamic revolution in the most unlikely country of the region, Iran. The last two presidents indeed hammered the last nails into the coffin of a friend who took side with the United States from the beginning of his kingship, hoping together they could bring peace, freedom, and prosperity to the Iranian people. America gave us generous and valuable financial and military assistance, thus greatly facilitating our task in the implementation of our vast economic and general development and security plans for which I wish to express to you our deep gratitude and sincerest thanks. We are absolutely certain that the freedom and security of peoples around the world as well as your own security, depend upon the will and determination of the American people to continue with the struggle without lagging. We hope that you decide, as you have in the past, that it is worthwhile. But I can assure you that whatever your decision may be, that the people of Iran have not maintained their freedom for 2,500 years in order to now surrender. There has been no moment in recorded history when the Middle East was without strategic importance to the major powers of the world. Of these nations, one of the most important is Iraq's neighbor to the east, the state of Iran. As strategic importance undiminished, Iran is one of some 35 friendly nations to receive U.S. military aid since World War II. During the Kennedy administration, an agreement was requested by the United States pertaining to the status of their U.S. military personnel in Iran. A legislation later called the New Capitulation Law by the Shah's opponents. All communication was conducted in Farsi. Salam. 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 Inchist. 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 Bale. Mahan Darse Manra Yad Migirin. Bale. 
ما هم درسمان را یاد میگیریم بله ما هم درسمان را یاد میگیریم همه شاگردان درسشان را یاد میگیرن همه شاگردان درسشان را یاد میگیرن همه شاگردان This was resisted and delayed by two different prime ministers until 1964, when the Pentagon pushed Hassan Mansour's government with so much force and persistence to pass this ill-advised and unnecessary legislation through Iran's parliament. On October 13, 1964, this infamous legislation passed narrowly in a hand-picked parliament in disguise and among other legislation, 70 to 61, extending full diplomatic immunity to all American military advisors, personnel, and their families within Iran. Four status agreement that clearly violated Iran's sovereignty, reminding Iranians of the infamous capitulation law in the early 1900s, and a bitter history of humiliation during.